Well, Alan, welcome again to UCL Global Health. Food security is a massive issue for the poorest people on the planet so that they have enough to eat. It's about food production. It's about food access and the ability of people to command food. So inevitably, when we're thinking through policy uh, to deal with land uh, purchases or to deal with trade agreements, we come into the realm of law. And I'm joined today by Dr. Fiona Smith from our, she's a senior lecturer in uh, the School of Laws at UCL. And she's also the uh, chairman of the World Trade Organization Scholars Forum. Why, Fiona, why is governance and law so important for food security? Um, I think, Anthony, food security is a real problem. It's um, by 2050, there will be 9 billion people in the world that require right. food. And so I think access increasing is going to be an issue. And, and the way I see it is there's three big groups involved. Um, and this is where law can play a role. The first big group is states, because clearly countries have got domestic problems about feeding their mm. uh, individual people. And so during 2010, there were riots in, in Mali in, in Africa because there simply wasn't enough food. So states are very well aware of, of this. And so at the international level, um, the issue is very much about making sure that states that do do produce enough food are allowing access to those states that don't produce enough food. So there's a real issue there. Um, the second group of actors, if you like, that are a, an issue is corporations. Now, the World Bank showed in 2008 that there was a real need for more investment in agriculture in order to feed these 9 billion people. Right. Um, there'd been serious underinvestment for various reasons. So particularly countries like Tanzania, um, which have very good natural resources and plenty of land, um, they need help with um, making that land fertile, essentially. We'll come on to the about land grabbing and mm -hmm. protecting. So can I just go back to the States sure. for a moment? Um, during 2010, you, you mentioned Mali and I think Tunisia had food rights. That was linked very much to the Russian... Uh, heat wave which led to a big fall in their wheat crop. The Russians introduced an export ban. Was that a good thing or not? Yes, and Ukraine as well. So that whole area, huge wheat producers introduced um, export bans at exactly the same time. Now, the interesting thing about export bans is that there's been economic um, literature to show that in the short term, yes, certainly, they relieve the um, short-term problem domestically. But internationally, they create huge food shortages. So, for example, Japan um, is a net food importer. So the minute Russia shuts off its boundaries, um, Japan is, has real problems with access to, to grain. Because um, food prices go up. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. what, and <coughs> bizarrely in Russia, uh, for some reason best known to themselves, um, the Russians couldn't get access to food. Um, so the prices were actually increasing. So because mm. the, you know, there was an export ban, Russia couldn't export, couldn't get the money in. There was actually the prices went up exponentially. Yeah. So the Russians themselves didn't benefit. Um, so there were real issues there. Um, we see, uh, particularly when we think about the Russian ban in 2010, and one of the things there was there's a lack of law in this area. It should be regulated by the World Trade Organization rules because that's the organization that actually has rules to do with what countries mm. can and cannot do with their trade policies. But unfortunately, these rules are very much about uh, monitoring behavior rather yeah. than governing it, rather than stopping it. So the Russians just, at the time, were not members of the World Trade Organization, so there was nothing that could be done about it. And Ukraine was required to report to the WTO that uh, its grain ban was in place and it wasn't actually adversely affecting countries like Japan, which it duly did. And Japan said, well, I'm sorry, but actually there's a lot being, we are really being badly affected, please remove it. So the, the net effect on food security was obviously bad. Let's come on to the corporates. You mentioned the problem of land grabbing. Yes. And I was horrified to learn a statistic last week 
uh, over the last decade, 200 million hectares of land been sold to corporates in Africa, which is about five times the size of England or the UK. It's a very large area. Um, how do you regulate in international law or in corporate law against this or to protect people? It's very tricky because now you're talking about the relationship between what countries can do uh, domestically. So what we're interested in now is countries like, like, say, Tanzania, like Ethiopia particularly, that have rather underdeveloped legal systems. And so they're trying desperately to get these investors, these foreign investors, because they're usually multinational corporations like Monsanto that come and invest in, buy huge parts of land um, to, to... Oh, these are not... Right, this, this is major companies. Major, major companies. And also, strangely as well, uh, sovereign wealth funds, yeah. which are these companies that are created by states. So um, Middle Eastern wealth funds, absolutely, Chinese, absolutely. American... Yeah. European. Yeah, but definitely from the Middle East, yeah. particularly from the Middle East, mainly because the climate, obviously, in Saudi Arabia mm. is not conducive to growing uh, mm. crops. So these companies invest in um, countries like, say, for Ethiopia is a good example. The difficulty is that because it's a corporation rather than the state, even though there's a loose connection in some cases, it's about countries themselves being able to control behaviour. Now, the difficulty with a country like Ethiopia is that it has a weak legal system itself. It's really not able to control the sophisticated actions of a corporation. And the other problem that then happens is that there's all this international regulation, all these international rules that actually protect these companies. Because the assumption is that once these companies invest in a country, they are the vulnerable actor because the state's all powerful, the state's the one that has the laws. So they oh, so, uh, so the corporates are protected more yes. than the host nations Absolutely. in developing countries. Absolutely. So what you find, bizarrely, is any attempt to regulate... So the company invests, and you know there's an agreement sometimes about what yeah. they can do and what they can't. And then if the company violates that agreement for some reason... And the state then says, well, you know what? You're taking land that we didn't agree to. You're exploiting the local population. You're not paying them properly. Um, and there's very little comeback. Yeah, very little comeback. And <laughs> actually, bizarrely, sometimes the countries end up having to pay compensation to the company because they've tried to regulate oh, after charity. investment. Yeah, seriously. And it's bizarre because the... The, if you like, if we think about court cases now, so mm. you, you think, well, this is a really bad thing, so what can we do about it? Well... You would take the, um, if you were a, a farmer, first of all, it's nothing you can do. You mm. have to complain to the, your country state. They've already got weak legal systems. Mm. Forget it. Nothing you can do. In terms of the country themselves, they would bizarrely find themselves going to something which is an international tribunal, which is going to adjudicate the, uh, the investment problem. And these are arbitrators. These are commercial arbitrators who are only interested in the investment and the protection of the investment. So if there's a problem with the investment, which is what would happen in this case, we'll say, well, look, you're, you're changing the goalposts as a country. You're, you're moving them. You're changing them. The company didn't know. That's a bad thing. So these arbitrators are already favourably disposed. To the companies. To the companies. And presumably... Um, there is some corruption and bribes involved here. Uh, probably. And again, uh, domestically, um, there's very little that can be done for that. There's, there's all sorts of evidence of under-the-wire deals, okay. tax incentives, all sorts of things. So how do we sort this all out? I mean, is it the World Trade Organization, or do we need a, another global regulating legal land it's, body? It's very difficult. With the, to the extent that these things are sovereign wealth funds, if the sovereign wealth fund can be really connected to the government, really strongly connected to the government, then it could be the World Trade Organization. Mm. But to be honest, they're not interested. There's all sorts of internal issues with the World Trade Organization at yeah. the moment, so it's not the best place. So what we need to do really is think about regional initiatives, um, sort of like areas of Africa, countries getting together yeah. to regulate this behaviour. Yeah. And what I've, I've been working with a colleague in uh, Switzerland on this, and what we've suggested is actually what you should be introducing is this idea of public interest, thinking about protecting individuals' farmers' right to food because their human rights are violated in this case. And there should be an extra 
term in these in these investment agreements that say mm. there is an explicit legally enforceable um, obligation on these countries to protect the right to food and the right to these indigenous farmers to have right. to access to the land, which is not, this is, that's just simply not there. So the message for me is it's a human rights issue and for global health, whenever we're talking about evidence and policy, we've got to get the lawyers involved because basically it's about legislation and the enforcement of legislation. Yeah, but absolutely it's got to be the right rules. Because bad law makes it worse, as we see with um, Russia. Yeah. There's rules in place, but they simply don't work. And we need them here, horse meat. Absolutely, we do indeed, um, to check the, the food supply chain. Yeah. The, the problem is, I think there's always a danger of seeing the law as the ultimate panacea. Once you get the lawyers in, everything will be okay. But um, I would say be careful, because we're not always the panacea to the world's problems, no, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> Lawyers aren't the answer to global health sadly, entirely. Sadly not. Yeah, sadly right. not. Fiona, thank you very much. Thank you.